Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming um, to glorify um, two great personalities. When we, when we gave the title, what's the title of this retreat? Raise your hand. If you're not, raise your hand. Yes, you raise your hand first. The early days and before. Now, I've tried to trick you, by the way. Now, the early days, what is that about? Raise your hand. What is the er You don't even know. <laughs> OK, go ahead. <laughs> OK, anyone, what is the early days about? What is the early days about? The photos give it all away. Sorry, Paul. That's right. What are the early, what's the early subject of the early days? The early days of what? Iskand. Of Iskand, Prabhupada's movement. Now, what is the before? That is the tricky part. What is the before? Raise your hand if you have a... Okay, you're all so intelligent. Of course, we can't trick you even a little bit. Yes, it is about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And what we want to show by this is... Um, Oh, well, you'll find out very soon. But as an introduction, I have brought a teaching prop. Who can see what color this is? Green. Yes, very good. Now, who can see what color you are? <laughs> what color are you right now? Green. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you had to use my eyes to see that you're all green. But now, if I change it, what color are you going to be? You're all blue. You shouldn't be so blue today. <laughs> I think it would be better if you... Oh no, we better watch out with this one. <laughs> what is this one? Red. So you're all looking very, very, very red. And it's really true. You all look so red. And before you were looking so blue. <laughs> and we got to find the... Appro oh. Not orange. Yeah. It's actually yellow. Now... There's an important point for this. And now I've taken them away, and you're back to your normal coloration. Now, the point that I wanted to make is that in our consciousness, we always, always, and it's unavoidable for a conditioned soul to have a filter on. And according to the filter that we happen to be wearing, we're going to see the world in a particular way, in one way or another. It's unavoidable. And everyone has filters. Now, what does it mean to have filters? Now, the, the way that we understand this from the Bhagavad Gita is the three modes of material nature. One can be filtered by, this is artist, blue, green, yes? Yes, blue, yes, blue and green. And that's one interesting combination that you are. And then this is more violet. Mm -hmm. Yes, what's Magenta. violet is? Magenta. What? How do you get this one? Uh, <laughs> what, how, what do you have to mix together to get this color? That's a primary, well, a little bit of blue and red. Yeah, blue and red, okay. Now, so we can understand this the filters by the thinking in terms of the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion and ignorance. But also, there are, we can understand it in a very, very simple way also, that the culture that we're brought up in, and you've experienced this, uh, many of you, when you first got to Melbourne from India, then everything seemed very peculiar. There was a particular filter that you were wearing over your consciousness. It's not so much of your eyes at first, but it's the consciousness. And, and based on the consciousness, we see in one way or another. Or another one, um, what our desires are. And I've seen this so many, so many times myself when I'm looking for a new computer or a new car or something like that. Um, everywhere I look, I see computers or cars or mobile phones or whatever I'm happy to be, or new, if I'm looking to buy a house, and some of you may be looking to buy houses, then wherever you look, you see for, for sale signs. <laughs> and that's a filter. 
The desires that we have filter our consciousness. And also, um, some of you may have experienced this, when you're really, really hungry, <laughs> whatever lecture is being given, it's so boring. Because all you, <laughs> only if it would end very, very quickly so I could finally get some, something to eat. So all these different things, they, and what to speak of if I chant my rounds, what a difference does that makes if I see Radha Balava. If I chant good rounds, that makes such a difference in the consciousness, in my consciousness. And then when my consciousness is different, I see the world completely differently. But we should know that it's not the world that's changing. We may see it differently, but it's not the world that's changing, it's my consciousness that's changing. Now, simple point, obvious point, and a true point. Or take it even to the extreme, that if, you, if we see this desk over here, and it's a desk, and I see it useful for putting papers on and, and, um, and speaking in front of about Prabhupada, but if a, a little termite, a white ant, sees this desk, he looks at it, the same desk as lunch, something to eat, perhaps. Same desk. Now, let's just take this concept, this point, and just change it to some degree. And by seeing how someone acts, if we see someone who's eating the desk, we understand by that, that he has, we understand something about his consciousness. He has termite consciousness. If we see someone just running, 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 always, always running, moving, 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 and very angry, we understand that there's a particular mode of material nature that's influencing the consciousness, his consciousness. So by the activities of someone, we get a glimpse of what their consciousness is. There are some people who are very, very, very peaceful. Um, there must be someone who's very, very peaceful. <laughs> very, very peaceful. There's someone who's just naturally happy. There's some people who are very angry. There's some people always arguing with everyone. And, um, and there's some people who really want to control you. They are called bosses, if you happen to <laughs> any of those. They always, and whatever you do, it's not enough, and it's not good enough. And, and this tells something about the consciousness, just like the consciousness um, will affect what we see. We can understand what people are seeing, how they're acting, by what their consciousness is like. Now, it's their vision of reality that's affected by the filters that are covering their consciousness. Suddenly you are all looking magenta again. But then, when this is removed, then you are in your natural effulgent um, splendor. Now, here's the question, the first question that I would like to ask. Now, what is, I can see clearly what the vision is after the filter of green filters remove, but what is the consciousness of a person like who doesn't have any filters at all? Now, what would that consciousness be like? No goodness, no passion, no ignorance, no goodness even. What would that person's consciousness be like? That, for those of us who have filters on our consciousness, very hard to say, because we're even seeing how we think they are or they should be by the filter in our, over our consciousness. So, I would like to say something um, about Srila Prabhupada, but it's really true of, with perhaps some, di some differences between Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, very, very transcendental persons who didn't have filters on their consciousness, but even more than that, and we'll talk about the more than that in a moment. But I will tell you some, a few things that I said about, that I've written down about Prabhupada. He always spoke about Krishna. He was kind-hearted, he was soft, 
but he was very, very powerful and strong. He spoke gently, but if you ever listen to his lectures sitting on the Vyasa Sun, he's speaking very strongly. He's very liberal, but he's very, very conservative too. And he doesn't waste any time. He's tolerant, but, but uncompromising at the same time. Um, he's jolly and peaceful, but at times so intolerant that if you happen to be an atheist, a Mayavadi, or a scientist, you are automatically a rascal. <laughs> Just automatically. And he was, and he had actually, by 1976, he had millions and millions and millions of dollars at his disposal. But he acted like a beggar sometimes. And then when he, um, when he was amazingly humble, but amazingly ambitious. He even told Jagatuni Mataji and I in the Philippines, my desire is to make everyone in the universe Krishna conscious. But he was so humble on the other side. He could live in palaces. Wherever he went, there were like palaces and servants and whatever he wanted. And in Melbourne, they picked him up in a, in a Rolls Royce from the airport. And, they, and, they, and, and the reporter asked him, why did, you, um, why did they pick you up in a Rolls Royce? And what was his reply? Because, because they didn't have a gold car, a solid gold car. <laughs> Something like that. But yet, when he was in Bhubaneshwar or at the Kumbh Mela, he was taking a bath by putting the, pumping the water himself from the tube well, and then in the cold in the morning, pouring the water on his body. So all these characteristics, all these characteristics, they're contradictory practically speaking. He was so tolerant, but anyone who wasn't a devoted a person devoted to, to God, to Krishna, was a rascal. But he was so tolerant and so humble. He was so much like a lamb and so much like a lion. So how, what can we understand about a person whose consciousness was full of these kind of contradictions? And again, we can only try to imagine and understand what his consciousness is like based on the filters that cover our own consciousness. When Prabhupada would call someone a rascal, and we have, we conceive, we have the conception of a person who's a sadhu that they should have yellow a filter on. And they should see things like shanti, 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 everything is good and you can't criticize anyone and accept everything everyone said. And Prabhupada was the opposite of that, practically speaking. If someone said something that was true, immediately he would accept it. But I heard him say in a lecture this morning that one of the principles of having fortune in your life, one of the principles of having fortune in your life is don't give respect to anyone who is, is um, a rascal. <laughs> he was quoting Chanakya Pandit in this. He also gave two others in that, but maybe we'll talk about that at a different time. So what can we understand about his consciousness when we're viewing him through our filters? And it is very, very difficult and we could say actually it is impossible to understand what it's like. So I would like to suggest that if we want to get a glimpse or rather understand what Srila Prabhupada, understand his activities and what he did, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, these great two personalities that we'll be speaking about today. If you want to understand why they acted the way they did, the only way that you'll be able to understand it is if you understand that was, 
what that which was covering their eyes, or in the words that Prabhupada used, the magic wand that they had, it was that they had premanjana charita bhakti velochanena. There is no other way um, to understand the activities of these great personalities. This will allow us or give us a glimpse to understand. See the heart, the consciousness behind the activities. And if you see that heart is colored with the magic wand of love for Krishna, then you will understand them. And otherwise, it's not possible to understand these personalities. There's a verse um, in Chaitanya Charitamrita. We, we usually know Vaishnavera Kriya Mudra. You know that verse? You know that one? That, but it, it, there's a little more to it than that. But it explains that the heart of someone who, who's um, Kore Udai, in his heart, that Krishna Prem has arisen already. That person, Tandra Vakya, his words, Kriya, his activities, and his other symptoms, whatever he does, even a scholar, even a great scholar, Nabujiya, he will never be able to understand. But this lens given to us um, by Prabhupada in these words to understand what they what the what is what is the engine driving them, what is the consciousness that's making them act the way they do, that is love for Krishna. And then you will be able to be able to put together these the parts of these the, the inconceivable activities of these persons. So um, so both these incredible persons were lovers of Krishna. They were servants of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of Guru and Vaishnavas. So, Jagtrini Mataji will be speaking about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and she'll begin in one minute. And I will speak about the early days of the Hare Krishna movement. And when in putting together the, this class, I was even more astounded by this personality that we know as Srila Prabhupada. So, that's how I'd like to introduce our class to you, and um, now we shall begin. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paskatya Desatarane So just uh, we're waiting for the computer to come. And uh, first I would like to say it's so nice to be here again with all the devotees. So many familiar faces and so many new ones as well. Thank you so much for all coming here so that we can uh, share in this way. Because the hearing and the speaker, the hearers and the speaker are equally important. Just like if there was no Maharaj Parikit, there would have been no Sukadev Goswami. So if there's no one to hear, then there's no one needed to speak. So thank you so much. I spent some time, as usual, preparing for this uh, presentation. Uh, and sometimes I noticed that uh, my consciousness with all its filters <laughs> would tend to uh, have me divert my attention to something else. I would find myself doing other things and then I'd go back and think I'm supposed to be making my preparation. And I just remembered an analogy that was given to me one time. Somebody said that if you see a very tall mountain from a distance, like you're looking at a picture of the Himalaya mountains, you see them from a very far away, you look at them and you keep your hat on. And you see them, they're very big, very nice, very big, but they don't strike you as big because the distance is so great. But when you come up very close to a very, very high mountain or a very, very tall building, when you go to look at it, you go like this, and your hat falls off. So the hat is like our sense of self. 
that we have a sense that we're our sense of importance, our sense of who we are and what we are hoping to achieve. And so when we look at saintly personalities from a distance, they don't intimidate us very much. We retain our sense of self and we see them and we evaluate their contribution. But when you go in very close and you start to study them, it's very, very unnerving because your hat falls off. <laughs> you feel like, what a fool am I? How can I speak about this person? I have no access to their consciousness whatsoever. When I'm reading about them, what is actually going into my consciousness and how much is just being uh, lost because of the, the filters, because of my own sense of self-importance. So I found it was quite a challenge. And uh, so I was thinking when I thought what a challenge it was for me, I thought perhaps some of the hearers will also find it a little bit of a challenge. Somebody told me that most people hear only 20% of a class. If you're giving class, if you hear 20%, you're in the average group. But nobody knows which 20% anyone is going to hear. <laughs> so, so the whole class is very important, but how much we can pick up and absorb, it depends on us. And as we have just so nicely seen with the colored filters, it depends on what kind of ears we have at that particular moment, what, we, what, what finds importance to us and significance. Now, the little video clip that's just coming, in a sense, you'll see for yourself, we're speaking about exalted transcendentalists who have nothing to do with this world. But when I put on this little video clip for you, your minds will all go to a whole different place. And you'll go there with your own filters. And you'll see what you see, and most probably, if you're like myself, you will identify more with what you see on the screen when we show it than the transcendental nature of a transcendentalist. Because, in fact, we are not so transcendental most of the time. And we identify with our culture and the world around us very naturally. So, first of all, we will identify with the culture and the world around us a little bit, not too much. And then I hope to take you into the adventure of understanding somebody who is completely devoid of that kind of mentality how they behave, how they act, and how they don't act, and what they try to achieve. So while we're waiting, I'll go a little bit into the early life of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So he was born in Jagannath Puri on February the 16th, 1974 at 3.30 p.m. Now the, sorry, 1874. Now the 1870s was a very turbulent time politically all over the world. The British were trying to expand their empire. The Germans were consolidating their empire, which was going to lead in the next decade to the start of the First World War. There were wars going on all over in the Balkan states, in Africa. Everywhere there was some degree of turmoil. A little bit similar or even worse than today. And at this time also, in three years after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was born, there was massive plague in India and millions of people died. You can see pictures of them with absolutely no flesh on their bones, nothing to eat. So many struggles are going on on the human level. So naturally, if you were to see uh, people were starving, people were fighting, people were doing so many difficult things or suffering in so many ways, we would be pulled to go and help them in a way that they could understand and we could understand. Give them food, open hospitals, try to calm down the people, educate the people on the difficulties and the dangers of war. 
But a transcendentalist doesn't think in that way. He doesn't think, he sees these things as symptomatic of something much, much, much more deeply that is wrong. And he knows that no one is attending to what is really wrong. Many people are trying to attend to the symptoms, but very few people understand what is the real serious problem. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, of course, he appeared as the sixth child in the family of 13 children of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who at that time was living in Puri as the district magistrate. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur himself, a very learned personality, born in uh, this same British era, he had taken it to taken to heart to study the philosophies of different parts of the world. He learned English very well. He was learned and cultured, and he knew all the different things that were going on, all the trends in the world of his time. But his interest was simply to see how to give these people bhakti. And he wrote, this is Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Shuddha Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's father. He wrote so many books. And because he had such a high position in society as a general magistrate, he was very, very highly re respected. So Bhakti Siddhanta was his fourth of eight sons. And his first early months and year were spent in Jagannath Puri such a sacred place. And then he went to uh, other places because Bhaktivinoda Thakur was transferred to one place to another by the British rule. And uh, at that time, Bhaktivinoda Thakur also discovered the birth site of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which to us now is a given fact. We don't, it doesn't mean anything special to us. We all know where it is. <laughs> what, what's so special? He discovered it. We also discovered it. But if you can imagine what Mayapur would have been like if nobody knew where, Shula, where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. And factually, there were people who were saying he appeared on the other side of the Ganga. And they were charging money for you to come into their small temple. And they were saying, this is Mayapur. This is the place of Lord Chaitanya. You give us some money, we'll let you come in and then you can go. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur was so deeply immersed in Lord Chaitanya's service that he studied maps, he studied scriptures. He was convinced that that was not the site of, of Lord Chaitanya's appearance. And as we know, he saw a vision and when he saw that vision, he understood that this was the place, the place that we all visit now. Or if you have not visited yet, you should visit in the very near future. So he, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's father, he actually revived the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition for the followers of Lord Chaitanya, at that time, were considered to become, have become extremely decadent. And they were not well respected. Any uh, educated person would not have anything to do with them. So we'll speak a little about that after. So then she Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he was at one particular point, he felt that he was working so hard. He worked by a clock, by a wristwatch. He timed his whole day. He slept from 8 till 12. He woke at 12. For two hours he wrote every day. Then he chanted for a certain amount of time. He took 50 cases every day in the, in the law court. 50. And all the Englishmen were astonished. How can he do that? And he would write them up. He, he didn't waste any time. He worked like amazingly hard. And at the same time, all his eating, his, his, his family relations, 13 children, everything was disciplined. 
everything was so disciplined, that he was so highly respected. So this very highly respected, well-placed, educated, from an aristocratic family, this gentleman was advocating the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu should spread to the rest of the world at a time when nobody thought very much of Lord Chaitanya and his movement. Bhaktivinoda Thakur took up the practical task of scrutinizing the theories of Western thinkers in the light of Gaudiya philosophy for presenting Mahaprabhu's message in a radically new context. He longed for and foresaw events that others might have thought to be just imaginary dreams. This was his thinking. Lord Chaitanya did not advent himself to liberate only a few men in India. Rather, his main objective was to emancipate all living entities in all countries throughout the entire universe. In every town, country and village, my name will be sung, Sri Chaitanya had said. There is no doubt, said Srila Bhakti, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, that this unquestionable order will come to pass. Although there is still no pure society of Vaishnavas, Lord Chaitanya's prophetic words will in a few days come true. I am sure. Why not? Nothing is absolutely pure in the beginning. But from imperfection, purity will come about. Very soon, the unparalleled path of Harinam Sankirtan will be propagated in all, all over the planet. When will that day come? Oh, for the day when the Western fair-skinned men from one side, while chanting Jai Sachinandana Ki Jai, <laughs> will extend their arms and embrace the devotees of our country, coming from another side, and treat us with brotherly feelings. When will that day be? On such a day, they will say, our dear Aryan brothers, we have taken shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya, who is the ocean of transcendental love. Kindly embrace us. When will that day come? So again, try to understand. Here we are all sitting together. Western, Indian, all together, serving together, living together, worshipping together. But in the 1800s, this was simply a dream. No one could have imagined what is taking place here today. So he also understood that this was a very, very difficult task that he had. Not a human being's task. It was an empowerment that was required. So then one night in a dream, Lord Jagannath told Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He said, I did not bring you to Puri to execute legal matters. <laughs> but to establish Vaishnava Siddhanta. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur responded, he said, your teachings have been significantly deprecated. So for those who do not know, deprecated means degraded. Significantly deprecated and I lack the power to restore them. Much of my life has passed and I am otherwise engaged. So please, 
Send somebody from your personal staff so that I can start this movement. Then Lord Jagannath directed him to pray to the deity of Bhimala Devi. And in this way, just as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had appeared in response to the call of Advaita Prabhu, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was sent by Lord Chaitanya to fulfill the prayers of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So we also know that six months, five to six months after he was born, he was born in February, when is the Rathiatra? Who knows the date? How are our Rian devotees here? What date is the Jagannath Rathiatra? June, July. So he was five or six months old when the Rathiatra took place. And the cart came to where Bhaktivinoda Thakur was staying. About, it's about a five-minute walk from the Jagannath temple. And now there's a big, big temple there to commemorate that place. And in the temple, the, the altar that is the seat of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is the exact spot where he was born. But in those days, it was a humble little one-story house, a little brick wooden house. And the Jagannath cart stopped right there. And anyone who has any knowledge of the Rathayatra uh, spirit, that when Lord Jagannath stops his cart, big, 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 massive cart, 50, 60 people on the cart, the deities are on the cart, hundreds and thousands of people pulling the cart. If it stops, you can't do anything. They would sometimes bring in elephants and big, big trucks and try to pull the cart. There's no logical reason why the cart stops. But when it stops, it stops. And the cart stopped right there for three days. Three days. And during that time, because Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur was a district magistrate, he took the opportunity to allow his wife to go up onto the cart and present the baby. And when the baby was presented to Lord Jagannath, five months old, just a little, you know, little baby <laughs> wiggling around, the baby reached, tried to reach towards Lord Jagannath in almost like a, a, a conscious way, you could say. And Lord Jagannath's garland fell and landed on the baby, on the child. And from that point, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur decided, this is the child I prayed for. So then he did everything in his power to raise this child properly. He decided to teach him everything that he could at the youngest possible age. By the time he was seven years old, how old are you? Younger than you. How old are you? Eight. One year younger than you, he had learned the whole Bhagavad Gita by heart. And he could compose Sanskrit verses as well. He also, by the time he was seven years old, he was chanting strict japa every single day. He wore tilak. His father, Bhaktivinoda, gave him his japa mala and told him, every day you chant on these beads. And he chanted on those beads for the rest of his life. Also, when they were digging to, to create a house in Calcutta, they found a korma shila, shalagram shila, very small, and Bhaktivinoda Thakur gave this shila to Bhakti Siddhanta. His name Bimal, Bimal Prashad. He named him Bimal Prashad because he was told to pray to Bimal Dasi, who is the internal energy of Lord Jagannath. So he, he prayed to Bimal Dasi and when the baby came, Bimal Prashad was his name. So he gave Bimal this little shila and told him, from now on you worship this shila every day. And he did. Could you do that? No. And you're a year older. <laughs> you're eight. Two years, old. Two years older. <laughs> Turning nine. And could you do it when you're ten? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is an, all, all due respect, this is an ordinary answer. <laughs> Normal answer. 
But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhimal Prashad, he could do all of these things because it was natural for him. He was coming with this as his mission in life. So then Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he also trained him in uh, writing, editing, proofreading. He taught him how to work the machinery for printing presses. He had him read all of his manuscripts. He had, from the very youngest age, he was training him and training him. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, later he exclaimed that he never ever thought of Bhaktivinoda Thakur just as his father. He thought of him as his guru. And he always treated him as his guru. And he treated his son as his disciple. And treated him also as an exalted personality. He said, if I call him Baba, I will forget about Radha. Because the worship, our worship is towards Radha Balava and Srimati Radharani is, is the Guru Ashraya. Guru comes through the mercy of Srimati Radharani. So he saw his father as a representative of Srimati Radharani's mercy and not just as an ordinary father. So I don't want to go only on and on about his life, although it's a wonderful subject. And we could sit here for hours and hours just hearing that, and we'd feel ourselves uplifted and transformed. But I want to share with you what was the climate in which he was doing his preaching. What was the mood of the times? Later. Later you can ask. You have to put your question in the box. You have to write it down in the basket is there. Okay? He needs a piece of paper. <laughs> There's the, that's where he put the questions in there. I have a pen if you need one. <laughs> so, when we see the times, it helps us to appreciate what somebody has really done. Just like in the modern day today, we know the times that we live in. We know how the atheism works and the materialism works. We know the things that we have to contend with. We know the pressures that people are under. So when we see somebody who rises up out of that particular cultural setting, we know how amazing that is because we know how hard it is for us to do that. So it's very important for us to appreciate these transcendentalists according to the setting of their times, what they were doing, how they were doing it, and why. So the 1800s in India was the time of the British Imperial Raj. That means that the Indian subcontinent was part of the British Empire. And the British had come in with a very, very powerful impact on the Indian people. So just see a little bit of their mood and spirit. Then we can hear some more after that. Thank you. Um, I must apologize for how quickly he was speaking. <laughs> I don't know if you could actually follow him. Did you? Did you? Did anyone have difficulty hearing? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, also the um, video was a little bit old, yeah, from the olden days. So it's all black and white and a little bit uh, hard to see. Now we're very modern, sophisticated. We all have smartphones and everything that's necessary to create a far greater e impact on the world. Yet, it's very difficult to get these little glimpses visually into what it was like at that time because nobody, no matter how smart they are and how good their phone is, can just walk back in time a hundred years and take a few photos. It's not actually possible. So we're not so smart. <laughs> We can just play around a, a little bit. But I think what you saw there, unfortunately, as I said, the, the clip is a little fast. But what you were asked to notice was the British. 
the British impact on India. Because practically speaking, every one of you here who is from an Indian origin, you have the filter <laughs> over you of the British. It's un unremovable. Because what did the British do? First of all, they came to India, they exploited India in, in an official way, in a business-minded way. Then they took over India and they made India one of their part of one of their colonies. And then, because they had no regard for the Indian culture and they could not understand in any possible way the Vedic tradition and spiritual culture of India, so then they decided to actually take over the educational system and implant their Indian, uh, their English ideas so that all students from then till now uh, have been, uh, they have been, uh, what's the word when you do that to somebody? Brainwashed to actually accept the English filter, how you look at reality through the materialistic Indian cu English culture. The ascendant intellectual elite of westernized Indians, this was at this time, remained mesmerized by the prospect of a better life that contemporary thinking and technological advancement purported to afford. Now, how many of the Indians who are here, not those who were born here, but those who came here, how many of them came here searching for spiritual truth? Listen carefully to this. Willingly indoctrinated to accept Western thought as the exclusive platform of factual knowledge and convinced that higher culture had to be learned from abroad, they eagerly embraced European-style education and proficiency in English as a convenient passport for entry into the political and commercial life of the world. And they snubbed their forefathers' civilization, culture, and scholarly tradition, although much older and deeper than that of Europe, as backward, ignorant, and at best, outdated. Such awe for everything European derived significantly from the white man's own sense of preeminence, now we look at us, <laughs> which seemed axiomatic. For although in India they were grossly outnumbered, there was less than one Englishman for every thousand of the Indians. And they were far from their own home. Still, the British nonetheless had been able to unify and control the formerly perennially fractured and volatile subcontinent. They controlled India. They were very intelligent. Their dynamism and their worldly superiority, their bold, domineering, entrepreneurial spirit, and their pragmatic, goal-oriented mindset. Don't these things sound familiar? This could be like, you know, <laughs> an advertisement for a new program that you should take part in so that you can be successful in life. <laughs> goal-oriented mindset and their continuous waves of extraordinary, undreamt of technological inv inventation, in innovations. Thank you. <laughs> Electric lights, railways, telegrams, printing presses, and ever more exciting gadgets promised for the future made the Westerners seem like gods more tangible than the gods of Shastra. Isn't this powerful? Don't you feel like this sometimes? You're in the grip of this? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Well said. <laughs> you see, all knowledge comes from the innocent child. 
Yet rather than discarding their traditions and cultures, many modern educated Hindus adopted modified forms of Hinduism meant to keep pace with Western notions of rationalism and science. So many educated Indians, they said, we don't want to give up our culture, so what we'll do is we'll blend the two. Very intelligent. We will blend the Vedic with the modern, and then we'll have this wonderful best of both worlds. Hodge punch. <laughs> that's what, that's what Srila Prabhupada would call it. <laughs> we'll have a kitri of everything in the world. So then they created all kinds of different movements. There was the Brahma Samaj, the Arya Samaj, there was the Ram Krishna mission, there was this one, that one. Each one of them saying, we will modify Christianity and fix it in there with the Hinduism and then we will just get the perfect match. So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was facing this. He was facing on one side the fact that the Hinduism at that particular time, the spirituality of India, was very static, not ecstatic. It was, <laughs> it was very much ruled by a hereditary creed of Brahmins and family gurus, and they set what you could do and couldn't do, and you could not accept, for example, you could not, if you were born in a non-Brahmin family, you could not do worship, you could not have a sacred thread, you could not, there were so many things you could not do. You could not eat in the same place as the Brahmanas ate. This rigidity was going on on one side. On the other side was this incredible Sahajiism that is so easy to slip into even our climate, where you see young or not so young or simple people, and they say, a little Hare Krishna and a little romance never hurt anyone, and a cigarette or two is also okay, and we just put that all together, also we make our own formula here. So on one side you have a sensuality, a non-philosophical spirituality, and on the other side you have a rigid form, and in the middle you have the British marching in, saying, forget about both of these, these are all rubbish, these are all prehistoric, there's no meaning in your Vedas, your Vedas are full of just mythology. Come and become rational, understand the world, get your passport to all kinds of enjoyment and pleasure and, and you can mobility in the world. Come and do this. And the English Indian subcontinent was frantic for this. They were frantic for it, frantic against it, but everybody was merging into this as their subject matter. Today we have our own subject matter that everyone is merging into. But please hear what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wanted to do. <clears throat> unlike all the other assertions, unlike all the other personalities who were working for a national cause, Srila Saraswati Thakur had no interest in upsetting the political status quo. He wasn't interested in getting rid of the British. He wasn't interested in the Gandhian movement. He wasn't interested in Subhash Chandra Bosch and his Indian army. His revolution was so profound and so radical that it rendered mere social adjustments as inconsequential. His was a revolution of consciousness that transcended social considerations by exhorting everyone, whether rich or poor, privileged or deprived, educated or illiterate, ruler or ruled, everyone, he exhorted them to discard the mentality of being the enjoyer and to admit to the reality of being eternally, eternally an object of Krishna's enjoyment. I'll read that again. His revolution was to discard the mentality of being an enjoyer 
Now, how do you feel about that? <laughs> That's revolutionary. We may feel I don't have so much in my life, so I'm not much of an enjoyer. If I had a lot more, I'd enjoy more. <laughs> yes? Say it quickly. If you are doing spiritual service, will you be the enjoyer? If you're doing spiritual service and you enjoy your service, would you be the enjoyer? Well, there's a very good question, you see. If you do spiritual service and you become the enjoyer of your spiritual service, that is not what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was, was speaking about. He was speaking about those who put themselves in the center and think, I am the one who should enjoy everything that I see. I am the one who should get the result of everything I do. I am the one who should be made happy by my situation right now. I am the one to which everything should be coming. This is the wrong sense of enjoyment. He was saying instead that Krishna is the one. You should be doing your activities so that Krishna will be pleased. What a revolution that is. I know that any serious devotees who are here know this already and they're trying to do this. And they will see if they're introspective, that every day, every moment practically, they find it almost impossible to do. Because they shift back automatically to, I'm the one. I'm meant to get the pleasure from this. I'm meant to get the reward from this. I'm the one to get the profit from this. So this was the revolution that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had come to offer to the whole world. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to transform this westernized, frantic, British, uh, uh, oriented, consuming Indian society with their rigid Brahmanism and their, their uh, casual followers, Sahajiya followers of Lord Chaitanya, to bring all of that, to work through all of that, disregarding each one of these as being the problem. Seeing them all as symptoms of the real problem and working towards working on the real problem. To change the misconception in the bewildered soul's heart. And so Bhaktivinoda Thakur had prepared him for this with the printing, writing, with the studying, with the preaching. He was an expert debater. He traveled throughout India, South India, North India, everywhere. And wherever he went, he would invite others, scholars, big Brahmin, important people, to debate with him. But nobody could defeat him because he was impenetrable. Not because he was sort of had a really good sense of humor or he was very clever. He had that. But he had absolutely firm, unwavering faith that God is the Supreme Personality and our life is meant to be used as servants for Him. He didn't waver. And therefore, as we come close to Him as a touchstone, you touch something to a touchstone, we've never seen a touchstone, but we've heard that a touchstone can make ordinary metal into gold. That would be good, wouldn't it? You'd have one of those, you could get quite rich quite quickly. But he was like a spiritual touchstone. And those who met him, who had the ears to hear, and ourselves who somehow are fortunate enough to also have those ears, we can be very, very much transformed by the inspiration of his words. Now you are going to give me the timer. It's right there. Is it? Okay. But I can tell you. Am I over time? No, no, no. You're just right on time. Okay. I thought I might be. Because if we, we stop now, then we, yeah. we, then we reconvene at 12. Okay. There's so much to say and so much to share, but in an hour, an hour and a half, you can only give a few little uh, isolated facts. But he's a very, very inspiring personality that everybody should read about. There is quite a lot of literature available on his life and his preaching. 
And of course, if you listen to Srila Prabhupada, you will hear Srila Prabhupada speaking, my Guru Maharaj said this, my Guru Maharaj said that. And one thing was that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati never, ever, ever, never saw himself as separate to his two gurus. He never did anything that he was taking initiative for himself. He was simply working on their behalf. And Srila Prabhupada embodies the same spirit in working on behalf of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Srila Bhakti, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and ultimately on behalf of Lord Chaitanya. So thank you. Thank you for listening so patiently. And uh, I'm next time if I show that film clip, I'm going to slow it down. <laughs> thank you. Hare Krishna.